I would like to thank all three of you for what has definitely been the most empirical panel, I think, of our entire conference, uh, because every one of your papers really presented a wealth of detail about each of the countries uh, that, that you discussed, uh, which also, I think, means that we will have lots and lots of questions on points of detail as well as general points. So once again, let me start with the traditional reminder. As you start thinking about your questions, please also think about how to keep them short. Um, and this also means that it's quite difficult for me to, to start with overarching questions because uh, Xenia's paper especially uh, deals with a very different political context from uh, the one that both Mikola and Alexander talked about. Um, so I want to start with a series of individual questions and the first I think uh, goes to Xenia about the Israeli context. Is it, is it possible or meaningful in the context of um, far-right uh, Israeli policies that you discussed or the, the sort of um, contacts between uh, a certain part of the Israeli political spectrum and the European far-right to distinguish between, um, let's call it ideological affinity and a marriage of convenience. The reason I'm asking this is that if you take uh, a case like Putin in Russia, uh, there is a lot of talk about his sort of ideological closeness with far-right parties and we know that uh, he has generously supported a lot of them and he has invited them uh, to Moscow, etc. But at the same time, he's a very cynical political figure and he's also uh, very happy to work, for example, with left-wing parties all around the world as long as they can be seen uh, to support whatever his political agenda might be in, in that particular context. So in the Israeli context, uh, are the phenomena that you described a matter of, I don't know, you said romance, you know, uh, a, a real sort of marriage of love and conviction between um, political movements in different countries that share very strong uh, points of content? Or is it, or let's say, to what extent might it also be a matter of we will be friends with whoever we think uh, will be conducive in their particular political context to furthering what we see as the Israeli agenda? Thank you for this question. Uh, well, I have to tell you that uh, you uh, called uh, Putin a cynical politician. Well, most of the politicians are cynical. This is coming from a politician, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, certainly, you know, uh, among the, you know, the right wing in Israel, uh, you have many people uh, who only are looking for the specific dimension, specific European dimension that allows them to clarify themselves from any accuse, from any accusation uh, of uh, leading to, towards the apartheid uh, reality in Israel. Uh, and for this sake, uh, it's uh, convenient sometimes also to put away the issue of Holocaust aside and to say, well, you know, we are not talking about this today. Yes, the, you know, some people in Strache's party are singing the, uh, when they will be, when we will burn the seventh million. That's correct. Uh, but uh, then again, not everybody does it. And then, uh, you know, you find some excuses. Uh, you have to understand that Israel being a very uh, self-centric, uh, you see it in our news, uh, you see it in our politics, uh, you know, we're not particularly interested in the others, let's say it this way. Uh, we are looking for mostly, you know, in our politics uh, for um, some uh, allies that uh, will allow Israel to continue with its current policy without getting punished. So uh, at the same time, uh, there was a feeling that during Netanyahu's uh, at least last four of his 12 years, consecutive four to 12 years, uh, there was this um, attempt uh, of producing something more than just alliance, tactical alliances uh, that uh, will uh, help uh, him to deal uh, with the pressure from the traditional European uh, uh, allies and the big countries. Uh, and um, it was the so-called the union of the conservatives. Uh, I think it was an American idea, but then again, Netanyahu also was brought up uh, as an American politician with American advisors, uh, and many of the things that he says and does, you know, they're inspired directly uh, by the Republican politics in the United States. So uh, 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 if uh, you uh, saw the, uh, the signs that were all across uh, Israel during his political campaign in 2019, probably it was very, uh, you know, uh, hard to miss it, then you saw uh, him shaking hands with Narendra Modi and Donald Trump, 
and Vladimir Putin, okay? So no one uh, from the ruling European leaders were there. Although, you know, uh, I think that uh, Israel has much more trade uh, with Europe, uh, specifically with Germany and with France, uh, but he didn't put a picture of uh, him with Angela Merkel. Uh, and uh, there was a reason why, you know, because you are talking not only about this tactical marriage uh, of uh, convenience, you are talking, talking, talking about something more. Uh, you know, this attempt of, uh, you know, creating this league uh, of uh, countries who object to the uh, liberal politics, uh, to, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, to the left uh, in all of its uh, uh, faces in Israel or in Europe or, or, or in the USSR, or in the, U in the US. Uh, USSR, it's maybe Freudian uh, because uh, I think we are going there very quickly. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, I would say that, you know, the average Israeli is really not interested, you know, who is uh, saying what to whom in Europe, uh, and the only, uh, you know, uh, the interest, you know, arises when you have some anti-Semitic attacks. Anti-Semitic attacks, uh, you know, very often, you know, are performed uh, by uh, the immigrants from Muslim countries. Uh, then you have the uh, immediate understanding that, well, you know, uh, so there, there is something to what Le Pen is saying. There is something to what Fini was saying. Uh, and um, unfortunately, as Israel becomes more right, even center today is actually right. Uh, it's not really a center, you know, it's uh, right inspired. Uh, it's called center, but it's not really uh, one anymore. Uh, then, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, you, you see that uh, this is also, you know, it's not only uh, real politic, it's much more than that. Thank you very much. So, in my question to uh, Alexander Virchowski, I want to take uh, my cues from some of the things that Ksenia just said. Uh, one of them is anti-Semitic attacks, and we heard from you that, in fact, there are perhaps surprisingly few, actually, uh, of them in Russia. Um, and the other is the whole topic of uh, Islam and Islamophobia, which plays a, a major and increasing role in both Israeli but also especially West European debates about this whole issue, um, but which doesn't seem to play that much of a part in these discussions in Russia. Um, so. Perhaps since you've also looked at uh, cases of Islamophobia, not just anti-Semitism in the Russian case, you could say a few words about how the configuration works differently in the Russian case between anti-Semitic attacks, Islamophobia inside Russia, but then a sort of outward rhetoric uh, that is directed at Western Europe, where Russia very strongly supports this whole discourse of Western Europe being overrun by dangerous Muslim immigrants, which is not something that's applied that strongly to the Russian context, because in Russia itself, of course, we want to say that you know, there is stability, all confessions get along with each other, etc. So how, you know, how, does that, how is the, are these two things articulated with each other? Um, not easy to answer, because there is no simple picture. In fact, there is no system. Uh, when we... Uh, talk about Russian official position, it's mostly, in, it, it, okay, maybe not mostly, but in many cases, it's not a position, it's a propaganda which is, which is fluid and maybe change from case to case, and depending on uh, the audience uh, and some maybe circumstances. So first of all, uh, Islamophobia as intolerance to Islam let's say, let's try to differentiate it, and to Muslims, uh, is very much different. Uh, there were surveys that in our population, there is much more negative attitude to Islam than to Muslims, because Islam is seen as an ideology which is supposed to be dangerous or partly dangerous, related to terrorism, while Muslims are the guys whom we see and they are not so dangerous as we see. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, there is uh, ethnic xenophobia, which may be oriented, and in practice is mostly oriented against ethnicities, which are mostly uh, uh, Muslim, which is not perceived as religion at all. That's, that's how it is different, as I understand, from Europe. Uh, that's why there are very few religiously motivated uh, hate crimes in Russia, for example. They are mostly Practically all of them are ethnically motivated, if, it's, if to exclude against uh, attacks against LGBT. Uh, but um, uh, on the official level, if we turn from this, let's say, activists to official level, of course, officially we have this 
hierarchy of cultures or, uh, and religions, uh, which together uh, create our unique Russian civilization, including Islam, of course. But only proper Islam, our Islam, which is called traditional, and non-traditional Islam is a dangerous one. Uh, that's a very, uh, not very old, but 20 years old, concept based on the, on the real practice of uh, Salafi, uh, let's say, expansion to Northern Caucasus, which was related uh, partly to the violent wa wave there. Uh, so it, that, that's, it's related to this whole sphere of religion in Russia that any uh, non-traditionalness is seen as a danger. Uh, uh, first of all, of course, in Islam. So uh, officially, Islam is good, but non-traditional Islam is bad. So uh, those, let's say, dangerous Muslim migrants in Europe who are present a danger for, for Europeans, they described as those non-traditional ones, uh, if, if needed, if, if any explanation is needed, let's say. Uh, uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, this threat to Europe may be also Mm, how to say it? Uh, it? It's difficult. Sometimes it's difficult to find a sympathy to to Europe in this situation as, as a victim of this Muslim expansion, because this expansion and the European weakness uh, is seen as a sign of the whole degradation of Western civilization, which proves again superiority of our civilization and other traditional civilizations, and we, we, traditional civilizations, together oppose this Western civilization. So it's a very complex uh, system, and certain elements of it may be used wherever it needed. But sometimes uh, something goes wrong, like it happened last year and previously in 2013, when we had a wave of official uh, ethnic xenophobia against migrants in Russia without any visible reason and without any understandable purpose. Uh, in 2013, uh, the wave ended with the uh, riots on the outskirts of Moscow and finally people on the top understood that it goes to, went too far and just stopped it. Uh, this time, uh, the wave just was forgotten because the war started. And uh, the agenda completely shifted. But we don't know what will happen next. Thank you. This brings me to my question to uh, Mikola, because I think that um, one of the things that became clear in certainly both of your talks uh, is how the whole conceptual apparatus and the terminology that we use in, in let's say, our post-Soviet countries is really so different from what people tend to expect here in, in West European context. And Mikola, I think, um, what, one of the reasons why your talk was so important for this conference is that you, you showed this in a very fine-grained empirical manner concerning terms such as uh, genocide and holocaust, where we can see that in a sense where the current Russian regime uses the terminology of holocaust memory, it tends to be directed more at a foreign audience, right? For, for it's, it's basically for Western consumption, whereas internally, the terminology of genocide is much more important. Now, one of my questions here is, why does this work? I mean, in a sense, it's, it seems so transparent that this is what's going on, and that this is you know, one of the many uh, forms of you know, cynical political manipulation of, of political discourse. But why do people like, like all of us still get questions in places like in Germany, France, etc., about you know, the terrible um, Holocaust perpetrating Nazis in the Azov Regiment in 2022. Why, you know, why, and this is a question to you as someone who's working in Germany, why do you think there is such a receptive audience for this kind of stuff here? Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for, for this question. This is uh, the, the question for me, maybe the, the most important, important question in my, my mind talk today, 
this was, was in, in, in the end. Uh, why it is possible for Russia to, it's to, to sell this, this, this for, for, for different public, not in Europe, in, in Arabic East as, as well, they can to, to, to sell this anti-Americanism and done for the European, so anti-Nazism and done for, for, the, uh, for, 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 for the right, so anti-communism, it's, it's amazing and I, I'm thinking a lot about it and uh, my question was, was was today as, as well about it, um, how it is uh, possible at, at all, and uh, what Nikolai Kos Kopas uh, answered uh, that it, this, this, this culture of memory uh, doesn't have anything to do with it, or, the, or the not, not so much to do with it, and I'm thinking if if it doesn't have anything that that with, what 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 does with, with with what it does have anything to do and uh, I think that uh, there is some some fundamental problems with with this culture of memory which which, which is dominated yet uh, in, in in the Western world uh, and maybe it contributed to this to, to this uh, disorientation and and weakness. Of, of the West in this situation and, 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 and not, not possibility to answer this, uh, um, this, this crisis which, which we now, now have in Europe. And I think uh, there, there, there are um, several problems, several core, uh, so core problems. Uh, uh, maybe the, the, the first and the, the most important is uh, that we, we we are trying to use uh, the memory about about this, this catastrophic experience in the 20th 20, 20, uh, century as some resource and some symbolical resource for intern, uh, intern political struggle, left against against right, and as, as some symbolical resource for, for differentiation for uh, us and them and, and, and so on, Fight, much, much more than, than some resource for, for analysis, for understanding of, of not on, only the past but, but in the current world. Uh, world now, and uh, uh, in, in, in this situation, so this discussion about, uh, very characteristic is this discussion about uh, fascism of Russia. Is this, uh, and I think that this question, or, 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 or Russia is fascist, fascist or not, uh, tells us about much more about the, the people who ask this question as about the Russia. Uh, imagine, so let's imagine that, that uh, we, uh, after, after, so, so, some, some, some analysis, yeah, and discussion, uh, we, we decide that, that Russia is, is, is not fascist. And what? Yeah, and, and what, 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 what is the difference? So, we, what, what, what this, 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 this war, uh, not, 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 yeah, so, so, so colonial war, would, would, would this, 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 uh, uh, this plan of, of genocide in Ukraine not so dangerous? Uh, would this, this rape and murder in Ukraine uh, differently evaluated? Yeah, uh, if, if, if Russia is, is not fascist, or if uh, Russia is not anti-Semitic, yeah? would, it, would it be so, so completely different? Yeah, but this is, this is a, uh, it tells us about, about the situation in which we, uh, we take into account much more some symbols, some political, political uh, differentiations and symbols as, as uh, the, the, the practical behavior. That is the, the, the one the problem. And the second is uh, that um, this, the, our culture of memory, the ex it exists in, in the world, so which semi-religious -religi world which uh, repeated it's, it uh, so every time. So it is frozen. Uh, it's a, it is war now, uh, after after the Second World War. In this world, Russia is always liberator, and 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 German, for example, is always perpetrator. And it's German must must feel as 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 as, as some some. Uh, some danger, uh, and uh, and Russia must must be in, uh, all, always off of this side of, of, of the, the good good world, uh, and uh, it, it it prevents us from from the, the 
rational analysis and, and struggle against against this, this this danger now. I think. I would just so frankly saying, I, I don't have sort of answers now. I'm thinking about it, yeah, and it's only only the versions. From Thank you. I do have one question that I want to ask all three of you, but if you have anything that you want to say to each other or questions that you want to ask each other or re respond to each other, then you're also very welcome to do that. Perhaps a small remark uh, in uh, regards to what was said uh, by Mikola uh, right now. Uh, so, um, and in generally, you know, in, in your speech also. Uh, so, um, we saw uh, that this apologetics uh, of uh, the Russians, they're always the liberators, uh, the Germans, and for this matter, also the Ukrainians. Uh, uh, those who cooperated with Germans, or those who didn't stop uh, the Holocaust, uh, in the mind of the collective mind of the, you know, Israeli uh, um, psyche, uh, it's basically, you know, you have the same division. Uh, and this rhetoric was very successful, uh, and it bears fruits right now when Israel is struggling with formulating uh, a sound policy uh, on Ukraine and Russia. And you hear time and again also from ministers, from MKs, uh, from journalists, from reporters, from uh, uh, analysts that uh, we, can com we cannot completely shun uh, Russia since it were the Russian soldiers that liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, and when you tell them that uh, in the Red Army, uh, not only Russian soldiers fought, but also Ukrainians and Belarusians and Kazakh and Tatars and Jews, uh, about 600,000 of them. Um, they actually don't have anything to say because this dichotomy, uh, it uh, forgets about the small nuances, but so important uh, nuances. So in this regard, uh, you, um, again, you know, when you know, I was spoke, speaking about the uh, convergence of interests between the uh, Israeli right and the far right and uh, uh, Europe, and then of course, of course, you know, there's something that didn't come inside my presentation. It was not enough time for that. But then, of course, uh, you asked the question about Putin convening some uh, uh, ultra right wingers uh, in St. Petersburg for the uh, uh, conservatives forum or whatever they call them. Uh, you know, so uh, I personally see also this, uh, you know, uh, shadow uh, of Putin's Russia, uh, also uh, that is uh, supporting, you know, the. Uh, you know, going to the same direction between Israel and the far European right, uh, and also what is happening in the rhetorics right now in Israel, it is being affected, you know, so these alliances, even if they do not mature to uh, sound, you know, political uh, treaties and so on, and also uh, these parties do not uh, lead right now uh, the European continent, uh, they were not successful in, uh, you know, going through the ballot box, but uh, you still have the, some kind of odor is, that is left. And this is, I think, the most uh, dangerous part, that you know, there is influence without somebody is actually you know, counting uh, what is really happening, writing down the notes. Uh, May I ask a question regarding, uh, let's say, general, maybe it's very, very general, regarding uh, Netanyahu period uh, of this policy regarding uh, European right organization. When we talk about Putin who supports anybody more or less who can undermine European unity and his, let's say, general uh, opponent, uh, we, we understand it's a very practical and cynical, in fact, position. But for more ideological party like Likud party, uh, it's not so easy to be so, so cynical. So they have to really to find something in common in this uh, conservatism, opposing liberalism, or whatever. But uh, conservative parties in Europe are very different uh, from each other and from Likud, as I understand. So how these differences are tackled you know, regarding attitude to LGBT, for example, uh, or anything else, or religious issues? Are there any problems here for, for Netanyahu? Or? Well, um, also the Likud of Netanyahu has a lot of paradox uh, in it, uh, and uh, while the Prime Minister himself uh, was always supportive of the LGBT, uh, at least, uh, you know, he uh, uh, was uh, speaking always very favorably about this uh, theme, uh, some members of his party were not at all uh, at this place. 
Uh, and uh, you have also right now the parties that were basically endorsed by Netanyahu, the very, very fringes of the far right, that made it to the Knesset only due to his direct involvement, that are openly uh, anti-LGBT. Uh, they are there due to him. You know, so politics, it's such a politics. Uh, what can we do about it? Uh, and um, as I told you, you know, then uh, in Israel generally, you know, and this is true also not only about the uh, uh, far right or the extreme right and so on. Uh, the main issue with Europe right now, it's the Israeli-Palestinian question that is mostly forgotten by all of the other world players, more or less. Uh, we are moving very quickly in the direction of reconciliation with the Arab countries that do not bother us anymore with this, you know, and the inconvenient question of what will be happening, uh, you know, to the Palestinian territories, what is happening with the settlements and so on. The U.S. is busy otherwise. I understand this completely, you know, there is China, there is Russia, there is everything. So the, the only guy who is left there and he's speaking with his not very strong voice, but he's still speaking and he's still, you know, active there. It's the EU. So the EU, it makes the ultimate enemy right now in the foreign policy uh, for the uh, Israeli right. Anybody who counters the EU and weakens the EU uh, and uh, makes less possible for EU, for example, to take a unified uh, decision, for example, on the labeling of uh, you know, settlement productions uh, or you know, sanctions on some other issues and so on, is a friend. Uh, and then all of the other issues are becoming less important because you know, uh, the, you know the, again, Israel looks at itself as a very lonely country, a lonely country among the nations, okay? So it is looking for friends and alliances, but in the, in the bottom of its heart, uh, it also feels that, well, there are no true friends. We have to uh, rely on ourselves only. This is something that especially the uh, Israeli right, Likud, they are talking about it all the time. We have to be uh, self-sufficient. We have to do it by themselves. But if we have some somebody out there uh, uh, that, uh, you know, with all of the problematic past, with all of the things that they, are, they said and done, you know, about the Jews, to the Jews and so on, they can help us a little bit vis-a-vis -vis the European Union, then they are friends. And you saw the difference, dramatic difference, you know, when with this government right now, uh, for one year only, prior to that we had Corona, prior to that we had uh, endless elections, you know, so uh, there were not many uh, political activity and so on. But during this one year, uh, the Foreign Minister Lapid uh, had met with all of the heads of the uh, EU countries, uh, supported uh, their relations between Israel and the EU. Uh, it was again get, going back to the basic, going back to the, you know, uh, I'm sure that if there will be right now a government that will be led by Netanyahu, we will see once again. You know, these differences that you talk about, they are there, absolutely. Anybody who sees beyond the artificial layer of the, you know, whatever, uh, you know, settlement supports, uh, support, uh, support and, and so on, uh, he will find out that there is, of course, differences. But again, we are not getting married to them. You know, so what? Uh, we're just looking for, you know, some extra support on the issues that are important to the Israeli right. All right, I'd like to bring this conversation back uh, to the main topic of the conference, uh, which has to do with, with how we deal with the past. And I'd like to take up a word that uh, Mikola mentioned in his uh, talk, which is monolocratia, pa the pastocracy, right? Applied, as applied to Russia. So uh, a country where a lot of things seem to be premised on the importance of the past. And it has kind of become a cliche generally in memory studies and debates about all these issues to say that, you know, since 1989, uh, we have lost a real vision for the future, so we have all turned to the past. So that seems to make the issue one of either a, an overabundance of talk about history or a lack thereof. So there's either more or less. It's either the past or the future. But I would like to encourage each of you to talk a little bit uh, regarding your countries, and Mikola, maybe you've talked about Russia, you've talked about Germany, maybe now you can talk about Ukraine, about the exact ways in which references to the past are articulated in the political sphere. So how exactly does this work? Because, of course, it's never just a matter of talking too much or too little about the past. There is always a particular configuration in which references, for example, to the Holocaust, the Holocaust memory, are important, and other contexts 
context where they are not. And we heard this from Alexander Virchowski with uh, reference to, to sort of Holocaust and anti-Semitism, et cetera. So maybe let's have a quick round where each of you for your own country, so to say, um, can talk a little bit about the exact ways in which politics and the past are articulated. <clears throat> and try to make it short, right, this topic. Um, um, it's very difficult. Uh, in fact, uh, Putin's, uh, we cannot talk about ideology maybe of the current political regime, but from the very beginning, uh, the, it was an important idea of reconciliation between different, uh, let's say, ways of our past. Uh, so it's even represented on the symbolic way we use uh, Soviet anthem, uh, I mean music, uh, and uh, Republican flag, and uh, the coat of arms which taken from uh, Romanov's empire. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's easy to, to show it, but anyway, we have to, sometimes we have to choose uh, what is better. And we see that uh, on the one hand, there are of course many, many references to Soviet Union, because when we talk about conservatism in Russia, in the living memory of those who, are, who live here, it's conservation of something which was in Soviet time, because more old uh, past is too old for us. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we hear even in the recent time from our president and from many others, a lot of harsh words against uh, communists. So there is still no reconcilia reconciliation. And may maybe it's impossible. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, when we try to explain the policy, uh, a special foreign policy of our today's Russian state, it looks like people who conduct this policy, they live somewhere in the middle of 20th century or maybe even in 19th century. They uh, think differently. When, when somebody criticizes them, they maybe even don't understand what's happening. Uh, if uh, Russia takes Crimea, uh, it may be called an annexation, but if to say that we return our Russian land, whatever it means, we, I, I do not discuss the history here, but if to use this rhetoric, uh, it becomes much more natural. It's like, I don't know, France takes back uh, Alsace, uh, or, or maybe Germans take back Alsace, or whoever uh, may explain it this way. Uh, because in 19th century, these explanations worked properly well. And they still work properly well uh, in today's Russia, in, inside, uh, for the whole society, and for those who are on the top. Uh, so uh, they really exist in the past. Uh, and this past is pastly Soviet, past, pastly pre-Soviet. Uh, so uh, it's mo mo mostly not an issue of attitude to the past, but uh, an issue how to try to, I don't know, to escape from it, <laughs> finally to, to the, to the not, not to the future, but at least to the today. Uh, and that still looks very difficult. Uh, to do uh, for, for the current generation of politicians, uh, for most at least, uh, in political, what is called political class. Uh, and I, I even don't know how could it be really done in the nearest future. Um, so, um, you know, you mentioned Elzatz uh, and uh, uh, this is actually, it seems like a nation history, but it's not. It's modern history in comparison to what uh, the time that Israel is living it. It lives a lot in the time of the Second Temple. Um, <laughs> it's the best. I mean, come on. Nobody, you know, remembers anything from uh, there. You know, it was a long time ago, so you can talk about whatever borders that you want, um, whatever, you know, reality of Jerusalem that you want and so on. So the glorious past 
2,000 years ago. So uh, then you have, the, of course, the most painful uh, and the most tragic moment of the life of the Jewish nation, the Holocaust. Uh, you know, I grew up in Soviet Union. I, I made Aliyah to Israel when I was 14. Uh, and uh, I didn't know such a word when I was going to the Soviet school in Moscow, uh, Holocaust. And then when I came to Israel, I still had three years in my high school. It was only the Holocaust that we studied. Uh, from all of the Second World War, it was only Holocaust, you know, so together it makes, you know, a, a sense, but you separate it from each other, then there is a problem, okay? So then there is, of course, the Holocaust, and then there is another glorious moment. This is, of course, the victory of the Six-Day War. Uh, and these three periods, in my thinking, you know, this is what uh, right now uh, shapes the uh, Israeli political discourse because we want to relieve that moment of you know, the ancient past of the 2,000 years ago. Uh, we focus on the you know, constructions of, for example, the city of David uh, you know, and some other you know, issues in this Jerusalem uh, on the actually houses uh, of the Palestinians who are living there right now because their past is irrelevant. They have not been there 2,000 years ago. Uh, then there is the Holocaust, which makes us the weakest chain, the uh, forever victim. Uh, Israel cannot go, right, go wrong because we are victim, you know, we, we are still a victim today, even if we have the superb army and the equipment that many countries uh, would like for us uh, to supply to them and uh, sell to them and so on. Uh, and uh, then it, um, you know, the, anybody who is against uh, not only the Jewish people in general, but specifically against, for example, the uh, government, you know, let's say Netanyahu government, uh, for instance, uh, it makes him a Nazi. Uh, so it's, again, this division between Nazi and, the, and, and his victim, you know? So if you're against, it doesn't matter if you're Arafat or Abu Mazen uh, or anybody from the uh, Arab, Turkish, or Persian leaders and so on, if you're against, you know, uh, it makes you a Nazi. If you are leftist opposition, you're a Nazi. Uh, and the, the, the uh, um, very, you know, uh, weight of the word Nazi in Israel today, it's uh, so inflated today, it's, it's so low, you know, so it's, uh, everybody's saying basically Nazi about everybody, you know, so uh, this is, uh, you know, very tragic, I think, yes, but a little bit funny too, uh, because it happens in the Jewish state, of all states. Uh, so then, uh, yes, you know, and then there is, of course, the Six-Day War that 50 years later still defines, of course, uh, our life, uh, still defines, uh, you know, the reality uh, of the Middle East where we're living, uh, and this, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, all of these three components uh, make the, uh, actually the, you know, prospect of what will be happening in the future, or sound analysis of what are the threats to the Jewish state today, not 67, not, you know, uh, 39. Uh, not 2,000 years ago, today almost impossible because you are always discussing the past. The past is standing uh, like a giant, you know, uh, 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 somewhere in behind and doesn't let you uh, make any other uh, uh, decisions uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, does not uh, sound right uh, with what happened uh, 50, uh, 80 or 2,000 years ago. Um, uh, thank you for this. For this question, uh, if you are talking about about Ukraine, um, I would say that that, that this, um, uh, this situation with situation with, with 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 the history and the past and and way of of, of, of dealing with with the past is uh, mostly so so so. so Utilitaristic. Uh, so, uh, as uh, there is some some set of, of of core values, which are important for for current Ukraine. So, independence, political independence, freedom, democracy, and uh, uh, individual freedom for uh, most most of all. And then uh, that, that that historical symbols are used used for for the. Uh, emphasizing uh, of, of, of that values and for, for creating some community around that, 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 that core values. And uh, uh, it's very characteristic maybe now as a situ as a, that situation uh, for Ukrainian historical memory, collective memory, 
uh, very important is uh, the experience of, of, of the family, of the Holodomor. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe uh, somewhere deep inside, uh, this, this, this influence is, is uh, never again. Uh, and now as well. But that is interesting for, for me as well that in public rhetoric, uh, this, this theme is, is uh, almost absent. Almost no one speaks about, speak, speaks about and, but mostly about fascism uh, because Ukraine, Ukrainians understand that they, they need some support from, from the West. And they try, try, and trying to, to, to sell what, what, what would be uh, important for, for, the, for the West. This is, this is interesting, interesting for me. Uh, so this is a very utilitaristic uh, approach, and um, the, the, the maybe maybe the most, the most, most uh, characteristic uh, example or, or argument that the last last president uh, presidential elections the candidate who uh, uh, tried to emphasize the historical issues lost and then the, uh, uh, the zelensky came with with, with the, 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 some motors that it, it's too much history we should to think about the future much more about the future because in history there are a lot of things which divides us and so, and so on and so far. Uh, uh, in, in regards with, with Russian, uh, this uh, uh, term um, pestocracy, I think it, 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 is, it is correct. Uh, uh, the, the past is used in current Russia for mobilizing of the, of the, the, the political support. It's uh, something like make Russia great again. And uh, uh, it works, but um, I have a f the feeling that uh, the uh, Rus Russian people is mo mostly depoliticized and demoralized now uh, and uh, uh, in what extent it, 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 it is effective, I don't know, but what is important now, I think that some people, uh, maybe some, 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 some uh, one person uh, in, 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 in Russia uh, thinks about, about himself as, as about, about some, some historical figure and, and, and things about, about the, the role in the, in the history and it is maybe the most danger, dangerous situation. Uh, and then maybe, maybe he believes in, 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 in what, what he is, is talking about. Uh, this, 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 is, yeah, this is the most, most dangerous thing. And uh, in Germany, um, I, 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 I have said that this, this country uh, in, in which past past never never goes away. So this is, repeats itself, and it prevents Germany from the uh, responsibility uh, and from from the possibility to react uh, with responsibility on the the, the, the current crisis in in, in in Europe and in the world. I think. Thank you all very much. Uh, the organizers have asked me to finish 15 minutes earlier than what is indicated in the program so that the next session can start early, which means that we have about half an hour left for uh, questions and answers. So whoever wants to ask a question, please line up. And um, unfortunately, because of the lights, it's very difficult to see, but yeah. I make it short. I have only two questions. One, uh, thank you very much for the lectures. One to Alexander Ferhoski. Um, you started late with uh, 2000, in the years 2000 and so on, but uh, how was it in the 90s? Was not anti-Semitism used also um, against Khodorkovsky to, to blaming some oligarchs? Was anti-Semitism used, used in that time? Um, like Orban uses anti-Semitism and take, using Soros as a, as a scapegoat. Were there any parallels in, in Russia? Internal politics, there was one, would be one question. And the second question to Ksenia Svetlova. Um, you talked about the other right-wing allies of Netanyahu, Modi, and 
you didn't mention Bolsonaro, but how important are these um, not non-European right-wing authoritarian people who are in government um, for his for this kind of policies in a global uh, in a global level? Because in Europe, it's only in Poland and Hungary and maybe Great Britain where you have right-wing politicians in power. So um, are they? They have, they have the same function, different function, and um, and uh, a last question: uh, How was Eric Zemmour perceived in Israel? Because he is a right-wing figure of a new kind of type, and more fitting maybe to uh, what Israel uh, would like to see in Europe. Thank you. We'll we'll collect a few questions, please. Hi, uh, my questions are for uh, Ksenia. Ksenia, you referenced um, very much, you focused on the Israeli right as having these ties with um, the far right in Europe, and that is very true. But can you not say that that is part of a wider, deeper, longer ranging policy on Israel, very much connected to the previous question, um, of alliances with totalitarian regimes, with uh, regimes that oppress human rights, uh, Israel's relations with um, the Philippines, with uh, apartheid South Africa, um, the genocide in Rwanda, all these things where Israel would give weapons to totalitarian regimes. Uh, all governments, all parties in Israeli history were involved in this, uh, and the relationship with Russia as well um, is, you know, continuing today, Israel's refusal to criticize Russia and Ukraine. I think all these things are connected to um, getting international support for the occupation and undermining international law. Um, so you, you, wouldn't you say that that is part of Israeli regime at large and not just a story of the Israeli right? So since a lot of these questions are close to each other, we'll maybe take two more and then we can combine some of them. Thanks. Okay, thanks. My question is also to Alexander. It kind of follows, follows up. It's about your definition of anti-Semitism. So I don't want to go into the whole slippery slope of how do we define anti-Semitism, but I think it's still helpful to, that you, if you give us an understanding of what kind of anti-Semitism are you capturing with your monitoring and also what's maybe missing, because we know anti-Semitism has different shapes and forms. And also, like, could you give us a little bit of insight how the contemporary Russian scientific debate about anti-Semitism and racism, like how is it conceptually framed and how, what, yeah, what theories you use? Because I noticed when you talked about something that I would define as racism, you spoke of um, ethnic uh, xenophobia, and yeah, I just wonder about the connections between racism and anti-Semitism in your, in your work, in your empirical work. And to Xenia, um, my question is about the relationship of, um, or this idea of eth ethnic self-definition and mononational um, society, and where do you place this as as an important link between the Israeli right and the other right-wing movements that we have right now. And one more. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the whole conference and also for, for this uh, panel, which is very special, I think. Um, my question goes a little bit in a different direction, but only geographically, and it's been sort of in the, back, in the front of my mind throughout the whole conference, and so now I, I'll bring it up, which is, where in this discussion of hijacking memory, the Holocaust and the new right, is the United States? <laughs> um, I mean, we're all speaking English. I realize not only Americans speak English, uh, but uh, because especially for, for Xenia, you know, in your discussion of the far right and the right in Israel, I mean, you know, we in the United States are sort of living daily in our electoral politics, the consequences of pro-Israel politicking uh, and, uh, you know, investment by not only APEC but other groups in our political system, which responds to money and uh, the sort of, you know, interference in elections uh, and the uh, support for defeating progressive democratic candidates, you know, sort of by groups like APEC, and 
and, and, and there the sort of the hijacking of memory is so obvious. And, and I'm just wondering how in your sort of this sort of various specific national contexts, and it's most obvious maybe for Israel, but also for <laughs> uh, Ukraine and, and for Russia, uh, the, the influence of, of this sort of big category of, of American Jewry, and within that, the smaller but extremely vocal uh, right-wing uh, American influence, which cloaks itself in pro-Israel rhetoric, um, but in fact follows a very anti-democratic politics. How you, how you understand that and how we might think about that in the context of the entire conference, because it is sort of a very burning political issue for many of us at the moment. And it's just striking to me how much we all speak out of our particular political, political and cultural and emotional uh, context and investments here. So I would love to hear uh, your responses on that. Thank you. So just to sum up, uh, we have questions to Alexander Virchowski about uh, older anti-Semitism and Khodorkovsky in particular, and about definitions of racism and, uh, and anti-Semitism. And then we have questions to Ksenia about essentially uh, Bolsonaro, Eric Zemmour, Philippines, Rwanda, Russia, all the, uh, you know, basically Israel and the world. Um, and also, also the question about um, the, the idea of Israel as a mono-ethnic society. And then uh, this last question to all three of you about the role of the United States. So who wants to go first? Maybe I may because it's simple. My, my part is simple. Uh, in Russia, anti-Semitism is seen uh, only, let's say, in the old sense, meaning some negative or discriminatory attitude to Jews' eth ethnic uh, group or religious group, and mostly ethnic, because in Russian, even the word Jew means ethnic uh, group, not religious. Uh, even even the, for religious, even the word is different. Uh, but so-called new anti-Semitism related to, let's say, unfair or discriminatory or whatever attitude to Israel is uh, discussed always separately. Somewhere in, in, di on, in different sphere is a part of international politics. It's, it's not about uh, anti-Semitism, at least as I saw it in Russian context, uh, including because uh, Inside Russia, there are not many, in fact, critiques of uh, Israel, uh, including from far right. Uh, of, of course, uh, they may be um, uh, have rather negative attitudes to Jews in general, but Israel is something separate because Israel is a good example of strong ethnic uh, national state, which is, in fact, they dream. Uh, uh, and they prefer not to notice maybe some details. If they are, it depends what kind of nationalists here we have. And th here I, I turn to the question about previous time, about 90s. Our nationalism is now different from 90s. Uh, of course, uh, we, we have all kinds of nationalists in the country, but in the 90s, the majority were more, let's say, nostalgic nationalists who dreamed about some uh, past, uh, uh, Stalinist past, or Romanov's past, or I don't know, some ancient uh, Slavic past, or whatever. Uh, but since beginning of the new century, mostly we see nationalists who prefer to see Russians as future, let's say, they desired future Russia as Ethnic, ethnic, pure ethnic state, or more or less pure ethnic state. Uh, and they, uh, they orient also maybe to the past, but not so far to some maybe interwar uh, regimes in the Central Europe, like, like Poland or, or Hungary. Uh, so, so it's different. And uh, this new nationalism, they see the enemy first in the more, let's, how they say it, actual ethnic uh, alliance. Um, 
migrants from south and east. And Jews are not completely forgotten, but not, are not actual. Anti-Semitism is used only in the, some conspiracy theories, of course it is. And uh, it's, it's, I, I would also add that sometimes these conspiracy theories may even exclude the word Jews from, from the theory, but it's still the same theory. And in this new, uh, let's say, advanced version, they may be used much easily on official level if needed, uh, regarding Soros, for example. You, you may say completely the same about uh, Soros as the source of world conspiracy, just not mentioning he's a Jew. And that would be fine for official rhetoric. Uh, but in the 90s, yes, uh, our anti-Semitism was more, let's say, traditional and was more related to some pre-revolutionary tradition on black hundreds and such things. And Soros was here, of course, <laughs> also important. So there are a few questions and I'll try to uh, kind of give the uh, frame for most of the issues that came up. Um, there was this question about the um, wider alliances with the totalitarian regimes, between Israel and totalitarian regimes. Um, and um, of course weapon sales, uh, whether to the junta in Myanmar, whether it's uh, to uh, some uh, other uh, unsavory regimes and so on. And uh, if you'll allow me, I will still make uh, some division uh, between this more you know, wider issue uh, and the question of what kind of uh, framework should there be between a democratic state and authoritarian regimes when they come into interaction. Uh, if only we uh, could uh, you know, satisfy ourselves uh, with uh, uh, relations with only democratic countries just like us. Um, that would be amazing. Uh, the problem is that most of the countries in the world, as for today, are not democratic. And especially this is true for Israel's neighbors. So Israel doesn't have much options of whether to uh, maintain or not maintain relations with uh, non-democratic countries, because otherwise there would be no peace accords with any of the Israel neighbors, their countries. Um, on the other hand, you know, there is this issue with uh, relations with parties that originate in uh, uh, Nazi, neo-Nazi movements and fascist movements. I remind you that Israel is still a country in which you cannot, I mean, there is no law, but you cannot play Wagner for a reason. You know, there are still Holocaust survivors and there is still this unofficial band that exists that uh, being sometimes, uh, from time to time, being challenged by uh, various uh, individuals that believe that it's time to put an end uh, to this ban, but uh, still, you know, you will not hear, uh, you know, Wagner played in the Israeli concert halls uh, or on the national radio. But you can, uh, apparently, uh, during the last 20 years, uh, so it came, uh, you can meet uh, and shake hands uh, with the representatives of the parties whose ideology is deep-rooted uh, in the ideology of the Nazi party uh, or other fascist parties uh, around Europe. Uh, and I specifically mention Europe because, you know, uh, okay, with the addition, of course, of uh, Northern Africa, yes, but that's where the Holocaust took place. Uh, and this, I think this uh, issue, yes, uh, with, you know, with the living memory uh, of uh, six millions uh, and those, uh, the Holocaust survivors uh, who are still living among of us, uh, it, you would think that it would make the Israeli rapprochement uh, with uh, this uh, far right uh, and extreme movements in Europe uh, a bit more difficult. Uh, as I told you in my uh, presentation, uh, unfortunately the uh, historical memory of Holocaust that is being bring, brought up every time, every time that uh, there is some uh, threat or some shadow of a threat uh, or some image of a threat against Israel, it's not coming up uh, during uh, these uh, meetings or during these alliances. At the same time, um, I would say that um, um, since its uh, initiation, since 48, uh, Israel, of course, was struggling for recognition. It was not recognized by significant uh, am amount of uh, countries uh, around the globe. Uh, and so I think it became a kind of a national sport to bring uh, as much countries as we can uh, to recognize us 
uh, at uh, whatever price that it takes uh, and uh, without getting too much uh, in the in the inside of you know who the countries are and uh, is it really worth uh, you know uh, approaching with them uh, I remember very well during the 2000s a strange episode uh, of uh, short uh, relations between Israel and Mauritania. We had for a very short moment an uh, embassy there. Um, it was nice uh, to say, well, we have another Arab country, African country, uh, that recognizes us. Uh, Mauritania at that time still had some cases of slavery uh, in it, uh, which was banished just a few years before. Uh, it was uh, effectively, it was a totalitarian country, authoritarian country, but uh, I do not remember that anybody in Israel asked too many questions about this, because then we would have asked questions about our relations with Egypt, uh, also authoritarian uh, country that is uh, guilty of many human rights uh, violations, uh, and also Jordan, but we also would have to ask questions about our Palestinian partners. And I, am as a representative of the Israeli left, yes, I'm dealing with this question. So uh, uh, do we want peace with Palestinians? Absolutely. Do we want peace with Palestinians if they will be governed uh, by an autocratic regime uh, that violates human rights, exactly like what is happening today? Yes, I still would want peace with Palestinians. Uh, am I obliged uh, to express criticism against this regime, uh, against Saudi Arabian regime, against because you know, now we are uh, reproaching very fastly with Saudi Arabia? Uh, then yes, I would definitely say that yes. Uh, but you do see that in real life this is not what happens and we have, uh, and generally also the US has, uh, uh, you ask a question about the US, we have less and less criticism of the countries that are considered our allies. Our allies, uh, if, if there are you know, some issues with human rights, but they, they are not you know, as important, they are not as grave as for example the human rights issue in Iran, for example, Reyes, or in uh, Russia uh, today. Uh, uh, and uh, so I think that uh, this is something that um, the left is basically dealing, uh, you know, with this uh, moral issue uh, around uh, the globe. And sometimes uh, you do, s you have some kind of uh, a mix up uh, of um, 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 terms uh, of uh, beliefs of uh, ideology. Uh, and uh, sometimes you really do, you know, see people that you know, the support in the left that support Iran, for example, despite the human rights violations, despite, you know, this country being a violent uh, theocracy and authoritarian country, of course, uh, because, uh, you know, they oppose Israel uh, politics on settlements, for example, okay? Uh, so uh, sometimes, yes, uh, you know, the, it uh, makes people feel a lot of confusion. Uh, and uh, in Israel right now, for example, there is a lot of debate uh, which I'm also a part of, whether, you know, the left in Israel should embrace the Abraham Accords uh, with uh, the Arab countries. They are non-democratic countries, obviously, you know, they are all, you know, Arab countries in the Middle East. Uh, yet, they are countries that are important uh, to Israel. Yes, they are partners uh, for a, a future, uh, you know, trade, uh, diplomatic relations, culture, stability, and so on. Uh, so what do you do with the issue of human rights? But then again, what did you do with the issue of the human rights uh, during the Camp David Accords in 1979? Uh, this is the eternal question. Now, I think that uh, this, you know, um, in opposing to the previous Israeli governments prior to Netanyahu, uh, in uh, Netanyahu, uh, again, because uh, he was so much uh, uh, influenced uh, by the Republican Party right, in the United States, his advisors came from there. He uh, uh, spent a significant time in the United States uh, and uh, also uh, uh, got very close uh, to some of the circles, political circles uh, of, uh, uh, of the Republican Party and specifically more uh, extreme parts uh, uh, of this party. Uh, and um, you see uh, how uh, these convictions that are pretty much far away from what Israel mainstream beliefs are, uh, for example, uh, regarding the you know, abortions, LGBT, you know, and these uh, issues and so on, uh, but uh, uh, Netanyahu is not there, you know, he's not conservative of that kind, but he is conservative enough uh, in order to forge, you know, more and more this alliance uh, with uh, uh, authoritarian regimes, 
uh, whether it's uh, Bolsonaro, whether it's uh, uh, Putin. Yes, uh, well, you know, I don't know what he would be doing uh, if he would be the PM today, but for now we didn't hear from him one word uh, about the war uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, and the aggression uh, of Russia uh, against Ukraine. Uh, so uh, you might think that, yes, you know, this is something that is, it runs deeper than the real politic interests of, okay, we have to survive. So we have to sell weapons to uh, whoever asks for it, okay? So many uh, Western countries do it as well, not only Israel. You know, there is constant uh, debate of, uh, you know, of these issues. But uh, I think during the last 12 years, uh, and also, you know, with... Um, uh, kind of rhetorics that you hear today, not again, not only Likud, but also uh, parties that are on the you know more right scale uh, than Likud. Now we have a bunch of those, uh, also in the Knesset. Uh, then you definitely hear that. Well, it's time, uh, especially uh, you know after the victory of uh, Joe Biden in the elections, uh, it's uh, time to uh, you know say who we are. It's time to forget the fear. Uh, this is something that I hear a lot. Uh, and to get closer with uh, those elements in the Middle East, uh, in Latin America, in Europe, who really understand and accept us as we are. Okay, so uh, this is a, a step towards, um, you know, a, a sounder uh, alliance, it seems to me, yes, that it used before, it used to be before, you know, so um, again, you know, the debate about the, the weapon sales, it's, it isn't something that is ongoing. Tomorrow in the Committee for Foreign Affairs and Defense, there will be uh, a debate uh, that will be initiated by a member of the Yeshatid party uh, about uh, more tighter control uh, over the weapon sales uh, uh, in Israel, uh, that it's, uh, it's not... Uh, uh, open, uh, you cannot really, even as an MK, you cannot really find out uh, what happens there. Uh, all, you know, sometimes uh, also only by leaks uh, that come later, you understand what really happened, but these things are really not going through the Knesset at all, which indicates, of course, on the weakness of the Israeli, uh, Israeli parliament. Uh, but uh, I would differentiate, you know, these issues, you know, when if you, if you know, you ask very important questions, uh, whether, you know, the um, uh, new alliances uh, between the Israeli right and the European far right, it's the natural continuation of this much earlier policies on weapons, uh, on uh, embracing the uh, totalitarian regimes or not. I would say yes and no, yes. Yes, obviously, because, well, you know, if you... You, you crossed already this barrier once, there is no problem to cross it again. And yet it, it is different, yet it is something that didn't happen until about approximately 20, 22, 23 years ago. Uh, or at least if it happened, uh, they tried to conceal it uh, because of the shame, because basically of the understanding that, well, you know, the, the people who make these decisions uh, of approaching for, with a guy like Fini uh, or, uh, you know, IFD or, or other uh, uh, parties of this kind, they know exactly who they are. They are not uh, confused, they are not oblivious, you know, they know perfectly well what is their past, what the things that are being said, and they make conscious decision uh, to do it nevertheless. You know, I think this is kind of a departure, significant departure from what used to be. Uh, to a more, you know, um, you know, sound conviction that, you know, this is the direction uh, that we have to take uh, and that the illiberal values are actually, uh, they are the glue uh, that um, uh, bring together uh, all of these parts of this puzzle that, of course, the Republicans in the United States, so at least the part that is being currently represented by uh, uh, the leadership of Donald Trump, uh, this is, of course, the essential part of it. Thank you very much, Ksenia. So, uh, Mykola, you've, you've talked about uh, Russia, Germany, and Ukraine, so you're an expert for, for the world. Would you like to say something about the United States and its, its role? Uh, only about the United States and Ukraine. This is this, this, this topic, uh, this something new, <laughs> new today. Uh, what I would say, uh, uh, that maybe the first, Ukraine may, is maybe the, the only, only country all over the world which doesn't suffer from anti-Americanism. So, Americanophobia, <laughs> that, is, that is the first. Um, uh, the second, uh, the, the, there isn't um, a special law, yeah, and the uh, United States is seen mostly as an imbalance uh, uh, for, against Russia in, in the struggle for, for surviving. And, and um, 
uh, in this, this topic of uh, the, the, the conspiracy theories in American Jewry and, 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 and Ukraine, uh, this, uh, uh, this problem isn't discussed in Ukraine broadly. Uh, but I met this, this, this idea here in Germany, uh, which is, uh, was, was, was said that Ukraine was, uh, was created uh, in, uh, by, by America or uh, by George Soros. Ukrainian nationalism was created by George Soros as, as some, some tool against Russia. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that, uh, so, uh, Maybe, maybe it is partly true because, because uh, George Soros and, 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 and uh, um, American foundations, uh, they, uh, they did a lot for, for the uh, development of uh, uh, NGOs in, 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 in Ukraine uh, from non-governmental se sector for, for the struggle against uh, corruption and, and so on and so far. Uh, uh, and uh, was, uh, it is, it is very similar situation is, is with, with EU. Uh, maybe Ukraine is among among so so a few countries which uh, are, which, which see the EU as as uh, some tool to 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 to, to struggle for the independence. Uh, so this is with America the same situation. So uh, as as a lie, uh, but. But this conspiracy theory isn't, isn't, isn't discussed, discussed broadly in Ukraine. And far right, that is, uh, as, as, as there is a big difference because Americans far, far, far right uh, are much, much better sentiments uh, regarding Russia as, as regarding Ukraine. So U Ukraine isn't, isn't a lie for, for Trump and, and for, for American, American far rights. Um, so that is a big difference. Even though Ukraine at some point became a topic in domestic American debates among people who know nothing about Ukraine because some American politicians or people linked to American politicians went there. But I'm not sure this has any impact on, on what actually happens in Ukraine. Um, I think we have time for maybe one very, very quick final round of questions. So if anyone um, wants to say something briefly, uh, now is your chance. And then, yeah, but please uh, go to the microphone, otherwise we won't hear you. Um, yes, uh, thank you um, for all for the um, fruitful discussion. I, have, uh, I don't have a question, I have a comment to Mrs. Svetlova. Um, it was very interesting to hear your point of view. Uh, but I think uh, I don't agree in one thing, but you said that Israel has no, no option. I think Israel has an option, and only one option, and that is to make peace with the Palestinians, to recognize the right of the Palestinians for their own state, to stop the occupation, and uh, to shake hands with the Palestinians and not with the Arab world, the totalitarian uh, countries, Arab countries. And uh, this is the only solution, I think. Um, and uh, shake hands with the Palestinians, with the Palestinian Authority. Uh, recognize their right um, just shortly. I have uh, no more. And this is uh, what I think uh, maybe it's a bit... Uh, Naive? I don't think so. I think uh, the Israel should look inside and start making peace with the Palestinians and recognize, recognize their, um, yeah, um, recognize their, um, you, you know, I'm a bit now emotional. Yeah, it's, it's, it's clear. Um, one related comment, I think. Back to Ukraine, could it be that the surfacing and popularization of the Holodomor discourse in, the, in Ukraine triggered this whole Volkomor genocide debate in Russia? 
chronologically. Uh, um, it, it was a point not, not said, but, 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 but thought. Uh, it was uh, uh, at the very beginning, uh, mostly reactive, uh, mostly answer on this, 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 this idea that that was, was uh, artificial and that was crime for Soviet regime against Ukraine. And uh, in line with it, Russians started to say that, that uh, it was genocide against Russian-speaking people and so on and so far. So this idea, it, it, it was partly so. Yeah, it was, uh, was initiated, but, but it, it was only, only one factor. I would say that uh, maybe the most important was this president in Yugoslavia. Putin uh, much more times uh, repeated it, that you, you could uh, do it in Yugoslavia, you could recognize uh, Kosovo, you could uh, this, this uh, bombard, bombard. Bomb, uh, Serbia, Serbia, because of this, of the, uh, this uh, go, uh, uh, genocide allegations, yeah. So in, in, in Yugoslavia, and then we, we we can do it as well. Uh, first time it was in, in, in situation with Ossetia. In interview of, of Putin, he, he said that directly: you 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 may do it, you could do it, and we can do it. And in, in case of Ukraine, maybe it was much more important, this, this analogy. Uh, it wasn't as a source, it was only, only as, 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 as cause, but, but the justification for that. Yeah, this idea to use these terms of uh, genocide as justification for aggressive politics, uh, aggressive policy. Uh, against against uh, say, uh, Georgia, Georgia and, and against Ukraine, yeah, but uh, f much more I would say it was to attempt to to use this this uh, symbolics and 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 uh, stereotypes in in the West, yeah, and this is this. this uh, uh, Connections between genocide and, and Holocaust and, and the fears on the, the Western world, so much more so. But it was was in, in, in case of Ukraine, it was some 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 clue for, for, for Russians to use this this idea. Would you like to react very quickly, because we're running out of time, to the, the comment about peace? So of just one sentence on the Holodomor, it just brings me to my memory that together with the organization that is called uh, the Israeli Friends of Ukraine. In 2017, we wanted to perform a, a, a hearing about Holodomor in the Israeli parliament. And uh, the secretary of the Knesset denied <laughs> from us this request because, uh, because they didn't give explanations. Uh, but just because, okay, so this is just again coming to the connection uh, between Israel and the uh, authoritarian uh, state uh, of Russia. Um, but uh, shortly on the, uh, you know, the remark, uh, I believe that uh, Israel uh, should make peace with the Palestinians for its sake, much more than for the, even the Palestinians. You know, it's our survival that depends on it. Also as a uh, you know, state of the Jews, as a democratic state, uh, we, in order to survive, we have to make peace, not to make war. I think this is quite clear. Uh, so the, again, not because of the pressure of the EU, not because of the threats, not because of anything like this. However, I have to tell you that it doesn't solve the question of relations with authoritarian regimes at all. In 2006, I used to be a journalist and I covered the then elections, parliamentary elections uh, to the, in the Palestinian autonomy. 2006, uh, Gaza, uh, many people that I interviewed told me, listen, we are not going to vote for Fatah anymore. We're going to vote for Hamas because uh, of the corruption and because of the violations of, of uh, human rights uh, by the Palestinian autonomy, by the Fatah. And this, uh, you know, this feeling just increased during the last, uh, what, 16 years. Uh, and now when you are talking to the young activists in Sheikh Jarrah or in other places, they will tell you, what? You want to make peace with the Palestinian Authority? Do you think that we will recognize it as people? So, I mean, this is just open questions for you to, to, un to understand that the reality in Palestinian territories, it's much more complicated than anybody thinks today. And it presents, of course, more challenges for Israel, because if you are going uh, to, like in Mauritania, uh, making some uh, fake peace with uh, somebody who even not maybe recognized by his own people, what could be the consequences of that? Just think about it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, thanks uh, to all three of you. I, ha I have to admit that when I saw that the organizers had put uh, a paper on Israel together with presentations on Russia, I felt uh, a bit lost. But I actually feel now that um, in some of our previous discussions about Western Europe, North America, and Israel-Palestine, some of the um, kind of the, the directions in which the discussion developed were kind of predictable because that's a combination that's heard very often, at least here in the German context. Whereas this particular combination, I think, has been, in a sense, refreshing um, because we really all had to think about what some of the parallels and differences might be because this is not, these are not contexts that are often put together in the framework of one and the same conference. So thanks uh, for that as well as your really fascinating presentations.